Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, St. Hyden, D, 3, 7. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Sage Hyden, the writer and video essayist behind the Just Right YouTube channel, with videos on Star Wars, the MCU, Batman, Avatar The Last Airbender, and so many other great films and television series. Sage does an incredible job analyzing the writing and storytelling techniques of visual media. With amazing deep dives similar to our own Canary Debriefs, his work strives to not only help us understand stories better, but to hopefully help us become better writers along the way. Sage, welcome to Whelmed. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. This is so much fun. Uh, this is like my favorite show in the world, so oh, it's great to... It's it's up there for me. It's uh, it's it's a favorite. Yes. Same same for all of us over here at Whelmed. <laughs> Uh, Before we begin, I want to remind everyone listening at home that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. So if you have not seen, read, or played, or listened to us talk about all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in my intro, but uh, tell us a little more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so um, I'm mostly a video essayist at the moment. Uh, So I make video essays um, about writing on my channel. And like the origin of the channel is that I just wanted to be able to have a job where I could spend every day learning more about writing. Um, That's awesome. So it's very satisfying and gratifying to have been able to do that. But uh, I'm also like, as as you said, I'm a I'm an aspiring writer, I guess myself, and. Hopefully the the channel is just a way to kind of help me get get to being a, a non aspiring writer. Like, a, yeah. Well, I think I think your content is fantastic. I love your videos. Um, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but uh, can I also ask a bit more about like what your history with film studies is? Uh, are you kind of self taught, or where did you start with that? I'm actually my my background is in li- English literature. Yeah. So I went to university for that, and I mean it's pretty transferable. <laughs> um, so a lot of the same. Yeah kind of stuff especially if you're like in the film studies as opposed to like film production yes. right it's pretty much uh the same a lot of the, a lot of similar theory but other than that as far as film it's completely it's completely self-taught um and just kind of applying what i know about uh story structure to film and uh reading as many books as i can about about screenwriting and um and anything related so well there you go uh, and so when did you first see Young Justice? Was it in the original run on TV or did you buy the DVDs or see it on Netflix? Or uh, I saw it on Netflix. Cool. Um, I think it was in like 2014 that I saw it. Um, and I was just like an instant convert to the series. I think I binged it immediately and and then went and told all of my friends about it and got them to watch the show. It's kind of a weird show to pitch <laughs> yes, your friends. Yes, true. <laughs> Because it's like, hey, there's this young adult TV show about the DC sidekicks. That's actually really great. <laughs> and uh, they kind of give you side sideways glances, but then they go and binge it and like immediately tell you, yeah, sorry, sorry, I doubted you about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it can occasionally be kind of hard, especially when you're like, well, what's the show about? I'm like, well, technically it's about teenage superheroes, but it's actually about everything. <laughs> so yeah, that's the amazing thing about it. It's the it's the whole DC universe in in one show. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, what was your history with DC comics or just comics in general before you saw Young Justice in 2014? Oh man, that uh... <laughs> is that a rabbit hole. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, like um, like when I was three years old, um, I wore a Batman cape for like a full year straight. <laughs> <laughs> so, like for a year of my life, I was literally Batman. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, like I think my, I think my oldest memory is, uh, my my mom was like making popcorn and, um, it it started smoking and we had to evacuate the house because the fire fire alarm went off and I ran back into the house to get my Batman action figure, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm not I'm not even sure if that memory is actually true. Like my mom tells me it's not, but uh, <laughs> but you remember. It's but true. To I you. remember it, right? Like it could de- it could definitely be like a confabulation, but it's my oldest memory. It's my oldest made up memory too, I guess. Um, 
but maybe I was outside of a burning building and holding. I was definitely outside a burning building and holding a Batman action figure. <laughs> So that works. That works. And so you were you were into comics from a very young age and into superheroes in DC from a very young age? Yeah, I was into I was into superheroes for sure. I never really actually got into uh the comics. Um I've read like a bunch of the like more well known graphic novels, but yeah. uh really for me it was the it was the animated DC universe because I think like when I was like, I'm pretty sure the Batman animated series was coming out like right then too. So I was watching at a young age. Yeah. That's how a lot of people get into it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. The animation, like DC animation has just always been a notch above. Like Absolutely. all of the the animated series and like a ton of the movies as well are just fantastic. Absolutely. So I, as I said before, I am a big fan of your video essays. Uh, so I can't wait to talk about storytelling and Young Justice with you. And one of the things that you mentioned when we were originally talking about this discussion episode was the idea of the core teenage team on the show being better characters than their league counterparts often are. So let's go into that. Uh, and I think we should probably start <laughs> by defining uh, what better means in this context, because when we were initially talking about it, I'm assuming that you mean like narratively stronger and more compelling, but... Yeah, that's actually that's a perfect uh, uh, perfect definition there. There's just more you can do with them from like a like just when you're looking at the characters from base from a baseline, it's just easier to tell a story about Superboy than it is to tell a story about Superman, right? Yes. And like it's a strength of the show that the characters are actually weaker, right? Yes. Yeah. So you know it's much more compelling, I think, to watch a story about someone who can't fly. And like really wants to be able to fly, then you you know Superman's perfect, and they have such they have such difficulty writing him in in the movies. Um, and I think you'd mentioned that like you haven't seen many of the DC uh, movies. Yes, I people people know I've seen I've seen quite a few, but around Man of Steel, I kind of kind of dropped off a little bit, and then saw Wonder Woman like four times, and right. then dropped off again. <laughs> Yeah, well, those were the, that was the time to to drop off if there was a time you were going to pick. But yeah, I completely get what you mean that the the characters being weaker allows them to have more conflict that they have to face. They can't just get out of any situation so easily, right? Yeah, for sure. And like, it's not just about um, a character having physical weaknesses, but it also comes to like you know they have more internal conflict as a result of that. Yes. So it's it's so great to put up. Like in Young Justice, you put up these great iconic characters like Superman and Batman and you idolize them. Like the perspective of the show is to like look up at these characters yes. and say like they are perfect. And you can just tell so many interesting stories of these younger characters who want to be that, but they just can't. Like they're just not quite there yet. And then sometimes they draw like an immense amount of conflict out of like, but wait, do I even want to be that? Yes. Like, uh, there's that great episode with, um, um, with Black Canary when she's like giving therapy to all of the, uh, <laughs> yes. all of the characters. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? That, like that episode is, uh, is phenomenal. And, um, it has that great revelation there that like, you know, is it, does Robin really want to be Batman? Right. And, and, um, there's another scene where Batman is, he's kind of getting interrogated by the league for how he's raised Robin. Right. Yeah. And he's saying, I'm doing this so that he doesn't become me, right? Yes. Like there's, so. Uh, no, all of that, I completely agree. And I think Disordered, the therapy episode with Black Canary is such an incredible example of like what you're talking about, of showing how all of these characters are dealing with so many different and complex struggles for each of them. And that episode kind of gives them each a platform to talk about them for a little bit. So like what specific narrative elements to you stand out as like facilitating this idea of the character's kind of being more narratively compelling than their league counterparts? Is it like the relationships between the characters or like the relatable struggles that they go through? Or as we said, like the fact that they're not as powerful as the adults, like are there any ones that kind of like stand out to you in particular? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's a, it's a combination of all those, those different things, but like, I think it really um, like it all adds up to a series where you can actually tell stories about the main characters where in a lot of the other uh, DC animated shows, you're actually not telling stories about Batman or Superman, yeah. right? Like the like those old shows, like most of the episodes are actually about the villains. You, you know, Batman is just a he's like 
he's just kind of the vehicle that we're riding in and we're riding next to to view the actual story of you know a flawed character who is going through some kind of struggle and turns civility right like yeah. that's like the premise of most of those episodes but by having your protagonists be characters who are you know they're they're weaker they are insecure about their weaknesses um and also you know it's the fact that the fact that they're children um and teenagers gives the writers um a way out of um having to have the superheroes be amazing and perfect right so like all of the like this the main like the mainline justice leaguers in uh in this show they're all kind of like stoic and very responsible yes. right <laughs> they are all kind of like sort of the same character <laughs> kind of boring <laughs> Which is which is okay, right? Yeah. Like because the story is not about them. But when you have these younger characters, you know the audience will forgive uh, Miss Martian when she makes you know horrible, horrible mistakes and you know makes terrible uh, choices. Yes, uh, does things that are immoral. Some of them will. Some of them will go yeah. online and and scream for years about how they will never forgive Miss Martian. <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe that was the bad character. <laughs> oh, is there? There's like um. I'm guessing about season two. Yeah. Or, or transfer. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I people people listen know that I am I love Miss Martian and understand that her flaws make her more complex and more compelling. And then some people are like, okay, but she did bad things, and thus I hate her. And I'm like, okay, but she's still a cool character. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting though that you start turning against her once she becomes older. Yeah. Right. Like it's it's in season two. Once you have said like, okay, now she's an adult. She should know better. She shouldn't be you know, reaching into people's minds and, uh, and screwing up their psyches, that's immoral. But like, if she did that in season one, when she's kind of like this, you know, ball of insecurity that like just wants to fit in, like you totally forgive a lot of the things that she's doing there. Right. Yeah. She's a really fantastic character. And I mean, like, you know, <laughs> what, what a comparison from like, um, Martian Manhunter who like, I defy you to try to write a story about Martian Manhunter, and <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. He's a uh, he's a much better supporting character. Yeah. So we were talking a bit about all of this and about how you were saying that the the Justice League in the show is kind of kind of boring, <laughs> just because they aren't the main focus of the show. They are much more supporting characters and something for the team to play off of, rather than like core characters on the show. But do you think that some of those compare those uh, compelling narrative elements of like the reasons that the team are so compelling as characters kind of extends to the Justice League and makes them more compelling in this universe? Because like like some of the relationships like Batman and Robin, we talk a lot about them and how I personally, this is one of my favorite interpretations of Batman in that we joke and call him Bat Dad. But in the fact yeah. that he's this father figure and is much more involved as a father figure is because Robin is the center of the show. And I find that really interesting and some of the other relationships on the show. So do you want to go into that a bit about like the narr the ways that the adults actually do play into the narrative and facilitate those compelling narrative elements and how the team actually kind of makes the Justice League more compelling in that way? Or do you see it like that at all? For sure. Yeah. Like when I say like they're they're boring characters, I don't see see that as like a criticism of the show. It's it's kind of just acknowledging that like they're they are playing their role in the story perfectly yeah um which it actually takes an enormous amount of restraint uh, which is kind of am it's amazing about this show even though like you know they're a little bit unrestrained in that they want to put like every single thing from the dc universe into the show and you know i feel like we're probably going to have a season two conversation a little later about you know they might have bitten off a little more than they can chew uh, in that season, but you know, to have Batman in a show where he is—that's a great phrase for him, Bat Dad. <laughs> um, he's he's just being the father figure, and you're not kind of indulging in the awesomeness of Batman, like you like almost all Batman media does, right? Like we fetishize Batman so much in our popular culture, and this show really doesn't like he has a couple of moments but really he's there to serve the purpose in the narrative where he is the father figure who everyone is attempting to be like yes and but yeah i do agree with you that 
he is more interesting than he otherwise would be because of how interesting Robin is, right? And Aqualad is, or Aquaman is a more interesting character because of his association with Aqualad, who is my favorite character. I, <laughs> it might just be the voice acting, but Aqualad, man, like really, really spoke spoke to me. Yeah, no, Kari, Kari Payton is fantastic. And I think Aqualad is, as a character is written so well and you get to see that fascinating arc for him from like being the stoic leader to like slowly realizing that there is a lot of stuff going on that he's just hiding behind uh, and all of that with him. And also comparing Batman and Robin's relationship to like uh, Connor and Superman who have a very different relationship. And to me, in a lot of ways, their relationship makes both of them so much more compelling as characters because it shows these immense flaws in Superman that you rarely get to see in a lot of other Superman media in the mm-hmm. the relationship of him being so uncomfortable with this concept of him having a clone son or later kind of coming to terms with thinking of him as more of a brother than a son. So do you want to go into some of that maybe? Yeah, it's actually kind of amazing how they've managed to ride the line perfectly with Sup- Superman in in this series because it's so easy to get Superman wrong. Yes. And this show... You know, the thing with Superman is he has to be, he pretty much has to be perfect, right? (laughs) Um, But yet you still have to find, like as a writer, you still have to find ways that he's not perfect. And, you know, to you have this like really strange conflict of, okay, how is he going to react to a clone version of himself that is now like thinking of him as a father? And that's perfect because that's a role that um, we haven't seen Superman in before, right? The kind of... You know, maybe I'm forgetting something in in Superman lore where there's a better version of him being a father. But we don't often see him in that role. I mean, he's kind of like the universal father figure. But like to have someone who is like, I'm your son, you need to parent me. You can you can get away with Superman making mistakes in the initial portions of that relationship before he learns, you know, what what is actually the moral choice. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and then there's also like Black Canary, which we brought up before of with her with the therapy scene, the therapy episode that we love and talk about a lot because it is such a great character moment for all of them. And mm-hmm. like her relationship as kind of this both mentor and mother figure and emotional core for a lot of the characters who don't have families, I think also kind of plays into that on both sides of making her more compelling and allowing us to have scenes like that therapy scene that makes all of them more compelling characters through her Mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting choice to pick her as the person who's going to do that uh because you could have picked any justice leaguer to to fill that role so it is it like in a way it's kind of interesting that like you know or it's almost cliche that it's like let's pick the one female character to be the motherly character right yeah but on the other hand like the way she's handled is perfect in that she's she's offering like such great advice and introspection to these to these characters that need it and also they're handling this character who is someone who is usually pretty sexualized in a lot of uh, a lot of our comic representations and she just isn't at all here right she's yes. it's it's yeah it's pretty uh yeah it's it's a, a good choice there especially cuz this version of wonder woman like if you're going to pick a female character for this position Wonder Woman is still kind of it's the version of Wonder Woman who isn't quite human yet. Yes. You yeah, know, she's yeah. she's this Amazonian. She speaks in, you know, in hero voice. Yes. Um, so to have like a real person in Black Canary handle that role is good. Yes. Uh, and like going back to that therapy scene, the one thing that keeps coming up in my mind is near the very end of that episode when Superboy has his moment where everybody thinks he's just being too tough to have emotions and his actual reality is that he's so conflicted about the fact that he was happy because he got to be Superman for a minute and Mm -hmm. how her response is, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, And how that kind of shows through these characters who are the teen characters who are so much more human than the Justice League in this series and in a lot of incarnations showing how she's just as human in that moment because she's been giving everyone such good advice and then she gets to Superboy and she's like, I have no answers for this and it mm-hmm. allows both of them to be so human and so vulnerable in that moment. Yeah, it's a it's a great decision um to not resolve a conflict like that to to just kind of 
leave it hanging and complicate it more than just, you know, sweeping it under the rug. It's kind of the amazing thing about this this show in general, the way it's it manages the way it manages to balance serialization. It's telling a continuing story while still being extremely episodic. Yeah. And to have, you know, characters like Superboy dealing with issues from p- past episodes and having it like dovetail perfectly into whatever's happening in this episode is it's just really good writing. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I personally, when I talk a lot about teenage superheroes, because I do that a lot, both on this show and in general, I've run yeah. I've run panels and talks about like this sub genre. And the thing that I talk about a lot is that these stories, these kinds of stories work best when uh, you allow your characters to be teenagers first and superheroes second. And I think that, that this show also does a really good job with that. Would you agree with that? assessment yeah absolutely i think actually that's kind of the distinction between seasons one and two for me yeah they still like they're still acting like teenagers to a large degree in season two season two is still very very good yes (laughs) um it's just a it's just a totally different show than than season one and i actually think it's kind of a genre switch in that season one is such a teen drama like <laughs> yes yes it is It is like it's like it's a young adult story through and through it's all about relationships and identity and uh independence actually like the first episode is called independence day yes yes it is <laughs> <laughs> just it's like perfect but so like, like that whole season is is just about like those intimate character relationships and it's much much easier to get like personally involved uh with those characters in those episodes and in season two it's i kind of think you could say they sort of drop the teen drama genre and it's it becomes like a um it becomes a a spy thriller yeah there's a lot of you know uh backstabs and betrayals and yeah double agents every which way yeah so like um i was thinking about this prepping for this like both both genres are very uh, focused on identity as a theme. Yeah. But it's in a completely different way. It's into it's sort of in a different way, I guess. You know, in the first season, you have these three characters who are dealing with, you know, who am I? Am I, uh, you know, Superboy is trying to figure out if he's Superman or if he's something else. And Artemis is, am I my, am I my father or am I part of the team? And then there's Miss Martian as well. All of which, amazingly, again, just dovetails perfectly into a single episode. Yes. Um, like the like the the second to last episodes of these of the show are always just like <laughs> phenomenal in how they bring everything together. Absolutely. But yeah, so you have all of those um, identity issues going on. But then you have in season two, it's Aqualad, but he's not really as conflicted as the characters in the first season are. Like he has a few moments with his father, but it's you know he's being a double agent. So like I de- like who is who he's pretending to be and and like the the psychological toll of pretending is weighing on him, but it's very it like the tone of it is so so different. It's so much darker and yeah. Yeah, no, I completely I completely agree with all of that cuz Aqualad's Aqualad's story in season 2 is much less about deciding whether or not he is his father or if he is himself and is more about just kind of maintaining that mask the entire time if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, like is he adult enough to be able to pull this crazy con off, yes. right? As opposed to act like actually being conflicted where like the first the season 1 characters were I was so mad. I was so mad <laughs> when he came out and he was uh in the black manta Ugh. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we all were. We all were. Those first couple of episodes of season two were very much a roller coaster of where is everyone? And then once we're told where they are, we're like, but that's not where I wanted them to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, where's Red Arrow? He's here. He's just a disaster. I'm like, I didn't I didn't want him to be a disaster. Can we help? <laughs> He's like really one of the most compelling characters oh, on the show, too. Absolutely. Like, like both versions of him <laughs> are are uh are great. Like Aqualad, like Aqualad's my my character, right? Um, <laughs> yes. So like seeing him be evil for a few episodes, and then not really getting to spend time with him, or having to, getting to see him interact with the other characters as much was 
it's it's disappointing but like it doesn't it's not a it's not a mark against the show that they wrote right yes. like you can't like it's funny because i just made a few episodes on uh the last jedi and there's a very similar thing going on here but yeah. uh you can't like write your own fan fiction and then like criticize the show for not being that <laughs> even though like it, you know in your bones you feel like you should be able to do that yes uh, yes because uh, like with the with the last jedi videos because i have watched some of them you've talked about how there are so many characters happening in the last jedi and how that uh contributes to just trying to narrow down what story arcs are actually happening. So with these themes that we've been talking about, how do you how do you feel about season 2 and the season 2 team and all of the characters they add? Do you feel like they're just as compelling and just as uh kind of like better as we've been saying than the Justice League or is it more complicated than that? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's definitely more complicated. Um like I Blue Beetle, Blue Beetle is great. Yes. He's he's fantastic. He actually like dominates a lot of, yeah. <laughs> of the season it's crazy how much that kind of takes over everything but other than him if i find it hard to point to another character where that's the case like there's moments where it's like that with beast boy i think impulse also gets quite a bit of screen time for his arc yeah for sure for sure he'd be the he'd be the third one there but i think the show kind of it it definitely um, broadens its, itself out like a little too much. Like if you watch that, uh, I rewatched the season one or sorry, sorry, the season two pilot. Yes. <laughs> and like it's a like half of like half of that episode goes by before we're even like with characters where we actually care about. Right. Yeah. Other than like the opening little thing with uh, Clayface there. I know even that immediately starts with dropping in like four or five new characters and just kind of throwing their names at you. And you're like, OK, wait, what? What is happening? <laughs> I'm trying to catch up. Yeah, no, like season two, it's definitely the show for comic nerds. Um, I hope that's not disparaging in any way. <laughs> but like it's like if you know all the mythology um, and who all these people are coming into it, then that helps a lot. I mean, like this, like this is the show that made me care about blue beetle for the first time in anything right like i haven't seen him in anything so like there's definitely like the show definitely succeeds at that but like when you have characters like like there's the episode when they have the all female team yeah which like i feel like that one i feel so bad criticizing that one because it's like on the one hand it's like great we have an all, we have an all-female team but like you're also thinking you know why couldn't it be you know rocket or zatanna yeah like the characters that we know and are familiar with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, like, it's kind of tough to just kind of drop Wonder Girl in here and drop, uh, <laughs> you know, Barbara Gordon in here. And it's like, yeah. uh, you know, we haven't really gotten into them yet, right? Like, I want the sh like I want the show to be about them eventually, but you know, it takes uh, it takes some some build up. They could they definitely could have done like five seasons just like in the vein of that first season building up to what they did with season two yes um and with with like wonder girl is always kind of my go-to example of one of those characters in season two who like i like the concept of her i just wish she had had more kind of and i think it is in that vein of talking about how we were saying season two kind of dropped the teen drama element a bit more and i think that kind of took away from being able to develop those characters as much as they could have been developed and like hopefully i'm hoping we'll see like some more of that in season three to kind of make wonder girl and tim and all of them kind of more <laughs> than what we got in season two like the joke i make is the fact that season two ends and we find out that apparently wonder girl and robin have been crushing on each other the entire season and i'm like when did that happen <laughs> when when was yeah. this happening we got nothing i'm like if this was season one i would have been getting episodes left and right about how you two were being cute in the background but here you're just suddenly together okay i'll go with it but <laughs> yeah that's that's totally that's totally true um I, yeah i had that exact same reaction i actually forgot that it was something <laughs> that happened until i recently rewatched that episode and i was like oh oh yeah oh okay um I guess that's that's another relationship that exists. <laughs> it's like, okay, that happened. Uh. Oh, I was just going to say, I think you can also get like uh, romance overload. If you have just too many romantic pairs on one show, you can call that the uh, arrow problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. 
Do you watch the Arrowverse at all? I used to. Yeah. <laughs> we don't go into that that much on this show <laughs> just because we try to stay positive and I yeah. eventually have rather negative feelings about the Arrowverse. <laughs> yeah. The first few seasons of each of those shows are are pretty great. Yes. But uh, yes. yeah, it they definitely, they, they kind of run out of steam. Yes. But I think as... I personally, since I am the person on Whelmed who talks the most about relationships, uh, uh, I feel like Young Justice does a really good job of tying it into not only being like, oh, these characters are being cute, but also in letting them, allowing those relationships to make these characters more complex. Like I recently did a whole uh, mini episode that people have probably listened to that was about uh, Robin and Zatanna in season one and how the Mm -hmm. second Zatanna joins the team, it humanizes Robin in a way that we haven't seen a lot of the time, just because we've seen Robin as like this very confident, very like knows what he's doing character. And then Zatanna joins the team and he's just tripping all over himself because he doesn't know how to like talk to a pretty girl. And I'm like, this gives us a new level to who Robin is. And I think the show did a lot of that with the relationships. Would you, would you agree with that or? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it always works in, it's always a good decision in writing to introduce a character that will reveal a different side of an existing character. Yes. And yeah, yeah, that sh- that show does it very very well in in season 1 and then like I think that's kind of the problem in season 2 is that you're introducing a lot of characters but they're not really in, you know, they're not informing you about any of the existing characters in any interesting way and y- the problem with that is that the audience already has, they already have their favorites. Um, and, you know, they're, they're very, uh, they're j- an audience, you know, and I'm a, like, I include myself in this, but we're <laughs> jealous with our favorites, right? Like we, and yes. we only want to hear about them. Um, so if you're going to put someone new, then they have to matter to the people we already care about in a like pretty significant way, like the, like Robin and Zatanna. But yeah, you, you know, you want to see, you want to see the characters that you already care about and if too much too quick just uh it it yeah it uh, reduces the the empathy that you have for those characters because you're just kind of waiting you know there's the <laughs> the the old adage is mean you know for when you're writing uh shows you know what's happening meanwhile back at the farm <laughs> yes have you ever have you ever heard of that one yes yes yeah uh, and it's yeah it's a great thing it's bit, you know when you have shows with like multiple things that are happening you are always like building up to a climax and then going, meanwhile, back at the farm, this other thing is happening. Um, and yes. you build that up to a climax, right? And it's, it's a great way to uh, keep an audience invested. But if you, have a, like, a, if you have a whole season where the audience is just waiting to get back to the farm, then you know, you're, it's, you're, you're kind of denying them a lot, of, uh, a lot of moments that they could otherwise be enjoying. And I think, I think season three will kind of, like I don't, I say as as if I know. I don't know anything about season three, but uh, you've I feel read like, the scripts. <laughs> no, not at all. They, um, they don't. They don't check with you guys <laughs> to see if they're good. No, they do not. Um, but I feel like season three, just based on what little we know and what little we've seen in like promo art and everything, will do more with like the characters that in season two were like what you've just added characters and I have no strong connection to them. I feel like season three is going to kind of allow them to be like, okay, we had that little bit of connection. Now we're building on that and kind of that way in which the show is trying to be a DC universe show wrapped up in just being from the point of view of the teen characters rather than being focused on them. It's focused on everything, but from their perspective and I th- I agree with you that sometimes that means things get a little lost. Like uh, season two, the one episode that I kind of say is like the episode in season two that I don't like is the one where uh, the original Roy Harper is going off on his adventure to fight Lex Luthor. And I'm like, I have no investment in you, so I don't have any investment in this scene and in this this episode, which is like a personal just me <laughs> me problem. But I do agree that the sometimes the fact that so many characters were introduced in season two and not all of them were given as much time as maybe they should have to kind of be as fleshed out as we're used to characters on the show being mm-hmm. that it's it kind of slows down that that narrative a little bit just in that way of 
we want to it's like we want to know more about artemis we want to know about more about superboy and you're occasionally just being like and this is wonder girl i'm like but but no (laughs) yeah yeah that's uh yeah that's definitely the problem it's kind of you know it's like on the other hand of hand of it though like it's kind of amazing what they accomplished with that season in yes, absolutely uh like it does like it is still it is still good <laughs> i'd i'd say right like i still enjoy quite a few quite a few of the episodes and like the overall plot of it is i mean it's it's super it, it's it's a, this might actually be another criticism actually like it's it's super it's super convoluted like the way like what the like the light is luring the it's working with the proletarians to lure the reach to lure mongol to get an alliance with dark like there's like a lot yeah. going on there there's, right it's one of those things it's one of those plots that doesn't make a ton of sense until it all kind of clicks together at the very end and you talk about it with enough people that you're like okay i think i get it now <laughs> yeah the the overall plot in season one was um like it's actually just as convoluted but it's convoluted in a way that uh works for the episodic nature of the show i like to describe it as like an accordion structure where that season could have been you know six episodes long or could have been 60 episodes long and the way they were writing it is that every single thing that happens is somehow related to the reach's plan um and then you have like six different MacGuffins that are all merged into one MacGuffin, where you have like a thing that can attack nanotechnology and magic and all this stuff at the same time um, so it's elegant in a way where, you know, you can write as many mini stories as you want and still have it feed into whatever, um, whatever Savage's plan is. Where season one, you're allowed to have those episodes where it seems like you're just having an adventure of the week until you have that little like stinger moment. That's like, here's how this ties into the main plot. Whereas all of season two is consistently only main plot and nobody ever really goes off and has a little adventure and has a little character development and comes back. Everybody's just hyper focused on here's the main plot. (laughs) Any adventures you're having are off screen. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's like, it's yeah, very much just uh, the adrenaline in that season is like (laughs) all the way to the max from the very beginning like earth is in danger and everyone's rushing around doing different things which is not necessarily a bad thing it's just so different from like what season one initially sets up yeah and it's it's so interesting how that how much that affects your viewing of a thing um because you've been you've kind of been primed to expect a certain structure and a certain amount of things to be happening and as soon as that sh- that shifts it like it is you you have a negative reaction to it because it shifted not because it got worse <laughs> right absolutely yeah like me me personally people people know i've talked about it cuz i watched the show uh live i was i watched it live when it was on cartoon network and the one week you've ended season 1 and everyone's a teenager and everything's fine and then you start season 2 a week later with like no time to even kind of ease yourself into this concept uh, and it's just suddenly everything's different and we're five years later. And I'm like, what? Oh, mm-hmm. no. And I kind of just had like that emotional, visceral reaction immediately of like, this isn't what I signed up for. And it took me like half a season before I was like, OK, it's good. It's just different. It's just yes. different. That doesn't mean it's bad. OK, let me let me catch up and be OK with it. Search my emotions. Yeah, it takes uh, uh, like you have to ref- like reframe how you're looking at it. Absolutely. It's- like it's not in it's not uh, it's not inherently bad you have to change <laughs> uh, which you know sounds like being an apologist for it because but it really is it's only it like it's only a problem if like you are someone where it's very important to you that it stays the same right yeah. like if yeah. that's something where you know i expected this show and um <laughs> and if it's any if it's different at all then it's then it's bad but yeah, you can definitely adjust to it, I guess. Um, but earlier, looping back around to something we were talking about a bit earlier, um, was you also mentioned to me that you like really enjoyed like the theme of identity that runs through a lot of the series. And I know we've touched on it a bit, but I kind of want to loop back to it and talk about it again because it is so important. Um, so how do you think that like those teen themes of self-discovery and like changing it, identity in the form of like Artemis, Miss Martian, Superboy, and all of the other characters too, but those are the three that kind of stand out when you talk about this, uh, contribute to like that complexity of these characters. 
Um, I think I may have like spoiled some of the things I were <laughs> like or, earlier about my, my thoughts on it. Uh, because yeah, it is kind of like, uh, um, I think they come, like for me, it comes back to the idea of it being, uh, uh, a teen, teen drama. Um, but it's what's like, and to even come back to like the first thing we were talking about, uh, where, you know, these characters have, um, very deep emotional problems that they're, that they're dealing with. And the story can, um, the story is a reaction to that as opposed to, um, us watching, um, like us watching Superman, watch someone else go through that. Right. Um, actually like, (laughs) have you ever seen, um, this might be like a little bit of a tangent to, to, uh, (laughs) go for it. That's what, that's uh, what happens. We're fine with it. (laughs) Have you ever seen, have you seen the Paddington movies? I haven't, I haven't, I've heard many good things, but I haven't seen them. Oh, they're fabulous. Um, <laughs> I've actually watched, um, there's another video essay channel um, called Patrick H. Willems, um, who he does a series called Explaining Blank Thing uh, to My Parents, right? So he'll like explain why like the Fast and Furious franchise is actually really fun. <laughs> uh, and his parents are like kind of um, <laughs> like baffled about what he's talking, like have yeah. no idea what he's talking about. Um, so he did one on Paddington. And then I went and watched Paddington and that show is, or sorry, that movie is like the way I would suggest someone to write a Superman movie, (laughs) which sounds absurd, right? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Superman should be more like Paddington. Do you want to go into that and explain why? For sure. Actually, like this might actually be a spoiler for an upcoming video of mine, but uh, (laughs) no, no need to spoil your own content if you don't want to. No, no, no. It's totally okay. I mean, (laughs) who knows? (laughs) I brought it up. I want to talk about it. (laughs) But no. So like in Paddington, Paddington doesn't have a character arc at, at all. Like he's just good. He's like the best person ever. And he sees the goodness in other people. And the great thing about those movies is that everyone in those movies reacts to Paddington and has an arc because of him, which kind of breaks like, you know, in re- like in writing advice, one of the first things anyone will tell you about how to write a story is like, you have to have character arcs. Um, your protagonist needs to have a character arc. And like Paddington is like a great example. And there's a few others of stories that can do this where the main character doesn't have a pad- have a character arc at all but they cause other people to have character arcs. And I'd love to see a Superman movie where that's the case because like in movies, the only really successful way we figured out to tell a Superman story is to tell his origin story, right? Just because like, that's the part of his life where he's growing and uh, learning who he is. So there's like some character change that you can fit in there, but it'd be fantastic if uh, someone could just, write a story where Superman doesn't change at all. And he just makes everyone else around him um, a better person. Um, That would be, you know, instead of beating up a city, I just, I would like to see that. Uh, I know we've talked about before uh, on our show about the idea of like good Superman stories aren't about whether or not Superman is going to beat the bad guy because we know Superman is going to beat the bad guy. He's indestructible. That's just what's going to happen. It's about how he feels during and afterward. Like the fact in season two, there's the episode where they, I can't even remember what it's called. I think it's called uh, Alienated. Yeah, it's called Alienated, where they go to like the Krolatean base and they fight Aqualad. And it's the first episode with Aqualad as a villain and everything. And it ends with Superman trying to save the people that they've been fighting this entire time because he doesn't want them to die and Mm -hmm. he doesn't succeed. And there's a line afterwards where Superboy, after they've like, saved superman from almost drowning just says he didn't save them he won't be okay with that when someone says superman's okay he's like no he's not he won't be okay with what's happened and it's like that's what's compelling about superman yeah yeah. it's not the powers it's not the flying and the punching it's how he feels about things and i feel Mm -hmm. like that ties into what you're saying of like superman helping other people and allowing other people to grow rather than just beating up a city (laughs) yeah no that's uh that is definitely like he doesn't tolerate any kind of moral failure. Uh, like that's the that's the classic uh, version of 
of Superman that uh, we're kind of uh, we're kind of missing right now because uh, we don't have a third season of Young Justice yet, and we don't have him in the movies. Um, I'm sure he's in the comics, but but yeah, it's ba- like basic Captain America is our is our generation's Superman. I yeah, think. yeah. <laughs> And with that idea of like that classic idea of Superman not tolerating uh, moral moral failure makes as that being like the kind of cultural perception of him as a character makes his inclusion in Young Justice and the way he's treated in Young Justice so much more interesting because he is treated as a flawed character who makes flawed decisions constantly and how that Mm -hmm. increases as we've been talking about the complexity of the characters he's dealing with because like there's that episode early on where Superboy finally tries to reach out to Superman and Superman just flies away and leaves. And that one moment tells you so much about both Superman and Superboy. It's like we've been thinking that Superboy is just a rage monster this entire time. And that one moment is like, no, he's trying to get help. He's trying to find someone. Just no one will help this kid. Mm-hmm. While Superman, who everyone, including Connor, sees as like, the moral high ground is making these these flawed decisions of like not even giving Superboy the time of day to like even give him a second glance. Just like, nope, not my problem. Not dealing with it. Yeah. And it's a great way to to question what Superman's uh, morality is because uh, he has a very, you know, very simplistic understanding of morality. Right. Like that's like who Superman is. So like they're able to sell it in the show that he sees Connor as a dangerous weapon and doesn't know how to deal with the nuance of him also being a person that, you know, has emotions that uh, he needs to to deal with. And that's actually, that's another great way to take a Superman story is, okay, you've got this guy who's always doing the right thing, but, you know, sometimes there's more, there are moral gray choices to be made as well. That's what the Captain America, like the recent Captain America movies handle so well. Yeah. But to actually, just to circle back around to your your question there about uh, like the theme of identity in uh, in this show, I think like one of the things that really aids that is what you're just saying about how he's how Superboy is like this rage monster. <laughs> but it's it's a great way to set up a character where you just highlight one characteristic, like <laughs> like you under like you triple underline it as like it's their defining trait. Um, yeah. And it's it's the same thing with uh, with Miss Martian, where you take a you take someone who you think is just like friendly and nice, but you just like underline that insecurity that she has about not fitting in, and just like draw every possible conflict out of that. And yeah, for all three of those characters, what's what's Artemis's thing? What's her? Because you got, yeah, I'd say it's, it's like anger. Yeah, because Artemis is a lot of a lot of anger. A lot of Artemis is about whether or not she deserves to be there. Like that's what Artemis is one, like her, her solo episode later in the series is literally called insecurity and is focused on her idea of like, whether or not she's on the team because she's a good archer and a good superhero, or if she's on the team just because her mom didn't want her to be a villain Mm -hmm. and kind of that struggle of whether she's here by her own merit or if she's here because people felt bad for her. Yeah. Yeah. That episode is like, is so great so <laughs> oh yeah i just love the um how like how good that episode is at setting up the stakes of it uh like both on an emotional level but on just like i just love any time one of these shows will do and like this is like not a new premise at all but like let's you know let's take let's have a threat that takes out all the people with superpowers and then leave the one person who has no oh, superpowers yeah yeah, yeah. That episode too, yeah, because multiple different episodes. But yes, because Artemis gets so many great episodes. I was thinking of one later in the season, but yes, that one too also illustrates that exact same theme of her being like, "I can't do anything if I don't have arrows," and her dealing yeah. with Robin and all of that. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, and she literally goes into the fetal position at one point, dealing with it. What episode were you talking about? I uh, I misunderstood. No, no worries. There's there's a lot of episodes, and they all <laughs> deal with similar themes. Uh, yes, it is a young adult show. Yeah, there's an episode much later in the season when Red Arrow first joins the team for like two episodes. That's um right. her yeah. Red Arrow Kid Flash uh going and fight an Aqualad, uh, and they have to track down Sportsmaster and Cheshire. And it's her dealing with, like, how does she be a hero 
without risking revealing her identity and how does she prove herself and how does she do all of these things wrapped up into one and her making those flawed teen choices as a result of wanting everyone to see her as a hero so viscerally that she like goes out of her way to make horrible choices. Yeah, yeah. She's like totally sabotaging the mission as it's yeah, going. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's another good one. I'll I'll like, every, all like there ones. are there are so many uh winners in that first season. Almost like no almost no losers. Like every episode has has something really great going on. Absolutely. And with this whole theme of teen identity that we're talking about, I think uh, we touched on it a couple of times, and I know we've touched on it on our main show, in the way that a lot of the characters deal with thinking that they have a binary choice between two options and slowly realizing that they can be something else entirely, with mm-hmm. Superboy being the most like clear-cut example of from the second he enters the show, he's given the option of being either a weapon or Superman. And he tries to be both, and he can't be either. And he has to go through an arc of realizing that there is something that is neither of those that he is also completely capable of being and that's him and how that contributes to him being such a compelling character in that he's not a rage monster when he's given the chance to not be and he's not as perfect as superman he's just connor and yeah. connor has problems but connor isn't a weapon <laughs> yeah yeah no that's that's a that is a perfect way to to summarize it uh and that's kind of like how i made a video on uh, the legend of korra um, that, uh, kind of, I, I talked about, uh, how st- like stories are in a way they're sort of like essays in that you have, or they're, they're a specific kind of essay, right? Like you have your thesis, then your antithesis, and then there's synthesis. And like, yeah, you've, uh, you've totally hit the nail on the head there where it's, uh, you have those, these two opposing things, and then you have to find a way that's a combination to a degree of them both. Right. But there's a third answer that you didn't originally see. And I guess you could um, we could probably extend that to to Miss Martian and Artemis, too, if we if we thought yeah. hard enough, because I think Miss Martian's a lot of that because I think too much about Miss Martian and people know because I talk about her enough. She's great. She's just is just a great character. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think with her, a lot of it is the decision between like whether she is like the white Martian monster that people think she is uh, on her planet or whether she is the like sitcom character that she models herself after and then realizing that she is both of those things and neither of those things. She is both the strength and power that comes with her alien form. And she is the more feminine qualities and the more cheerful qualities that come with the television she consumed when she was younger. And she's able to be both. She can wear a skirt and blow up a plane with her mind and you can do both. (laughs) (laughs) Hear that girls. You can do both. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> That's my thesis statement on Miss Martian at any given turn when I when I talk about her in season 1. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah, that yeah, that's uh yep, yeah, that's perfect. Um and then, you know, season 2 just uh rips the carpet out from under her, right? <laughs> um yes, it's yes. Uh, where yeah, you you have season 1 building up, you know, what yeah, what these characters identities really are and it's something that they didn't really see at the beginning and then we come into the next season and there's, you know, all these other questions about who they're going to be. Versus like Artemis, who you also brought up, who has like the decision of whether she is the Justice League or if she's her past, if she's her family. Uh, and then realizing that, again, she's neither. She's part of the team. She can make bad decisions and how those skills and bad decisions that she's learned over the years are helpful. But she doesn't have to use them for what she was trained for. And how season two makes that even more complicated when she becomes Tigress and all of that. Yeah. And that's like, it's another um, um, really prevalent theme in teen dramas is that you set up, you set up characters who are identifying themselves with a group, but it's the wrong group uh, to start with. And then it's all about building that found family. It's a good heartwarming trope right there. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's, but it's, it's so perfect, right? It just never fails. Like, found family stories are like just phenomenal i mean like that's that's why people love guardians of the galaxy is like you know i love these misfits who are individually terrible but work wonders together so yeah and i think because we were talking before about like the differences between season one and season two i think that that explains a lot of them in that season one is about this found family of a team whereas season two is more about the team as an institution 
uh, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Like yes. the idea that there's yeah. like an older generation and now a younger generation and like they even refer to them as like seniors and freshmen. Yeah. Like it's no longer this core group of young kids coming together to just be friends and be superheroes. It's now like much more organized and thus yeah. shifts that focus a little bit more. And it also introduces that element of, um, I mean, there's distrust in the first season, but like everyone assumes that they can trust everyone else. Yeah. To start with in that, in like early on in that season is like, <laughs> we're like, we are together. We're a family. And then there's elements where they start distrusting each other, but you know, they, uh, they come back together as a family. And then once it becomes like you're saying as an institution, and now it's, you know, there's all these competing agendas and, uh, you know, uh, Grayson isn't telling people what the plan is. And, you know, the younger kids are are pissed off about that. And that weird combination of like the younger kids are are kind of like trained to like you respect Nightwing. Nightwing's your leader. So they just kind of go with it. But it's all of the people who are his friends from season one that once they find out he's lying, it's not like it's not any of the younger kids who like get mad and like, I can't believe Nightwing lied to us. It's it's like Superboy who corners him in the hallway and is like, I can't believe you didn't tell me this. Yeah. I've been your best friend for five years. I've been one of your best friends for five years and you didn't tell me this. Yeah. Yeah, I know. The, yeah, the first season kind of like the team sort of feels like a sports team in, in the first <laughs> I season. I love that. I love it. Yeah. Um, and like it's very similar to like sports movies. Uh, in like the overall arc of how they all come together and win in the end. And then the second, the second season is it's a spy thriller in that it's, uh, it's this, this sprawling organization of competing interests competing against another sprawling organization, like the <laughs> organization. And then there's the justice league too. Right. And yeah. So, uh, yeah. So question, cause this just came to my mind of tying into all of this stuff we've been talking about. How do you feel any of this does or doesn't apply to Captain Marvel in particular, since he is both part of the Justice League, but is also a very young character, technically? <laughs> right. Yeah. He gets a few uh, few fun moments uh, in there. Is he... I can't remember how much he's in this. He's not in the second season that much, is he? No. Nah, he shows up in like one or two things yeah. is just kind of being part of the justice league but he does have kind of, is a bit of an arc in season one <laughs> across yeah, a couple yeah. of episodes he's in the episode with all the gorillas and the yeah. uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and shows up just briefly in the halloween episode to make everybody feel bad for him because they don't know he's a kid yeah uh and his his main one is uh the uh, uh misplaced the one with the world for adults and the world for kids right he can yeah, travel back right. and forth yeah yeah i mean you know, like themes of identity, like it's perfect. It's why like the teen, the teen drama genre is like the perfect fit for a superhero story because of like, like everyone has an alter ego in a superhero story, right? So you, you've just immediately built in this internal conflict of, am I this person or am I that person? So you've got that with, uh, uh, with Captain Marvel too, um, where he's got to pretend to be an adult, but he's like terrible at it because um, he's like so obviously a kid yeah um such a fun character <laughs> they really like he should really be having a movie like <laughs> you know like 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 i don't know why they're why they're bothering with uh <laughs> like they're doing Aqu like aquaman's coming now and if aqua lad's not there then it's i don't you know it's it's not it's really like, give anything a, but. give us a billy batson movie please cast cast a 10 year old as our main lead i want this billy batson that's a perfect comedic premise i mean that's like that's big but a superhero movie like, <laughs> yes it's, exactly it's perfect um, with what you were talking about of teen drama being like the perfect platform for teen for superheroes i Completely agree. I talk about this genre enough in things of when I'm explaining to people why I think this genre is so important to comics in that it allows you to take everything about superheroes to the logical extreme emotionally yeah. of just going from like, yeah, it's fun when you've got like secret identity and you're an adult with also superpowers, but like now take all of the stress of being a teenager and add it to that because mm -hmm. superpowers become such a great metaphor for like everything happening in high school <laughs> in some ways of like all of those like changes and social dynamics and everything and you just get to add all of that 
Plus, some people have laser eyes. It just happens. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You just throw all that stuff in for fun. But and and also, you know, with teen dra- teen dramas, you always have a very clear line between the kids and the adults. And it's again like the perfect application to superheroes and sidekicks in in this show. Um, it like it handles that perfectly, and it almost kind of. Uh, like in hindsight, it almost makes Cap like n- not using Captain Marvel more so- sort of an oversight, like in that he's the one character that is traversing the two realms there. Um, I mean, like you do have an an episode where he is literally traversing the two realms, um, but he could uh, he could really have been um, a, a bigger part of this that we'd be talking about a lot more. But I mean, you know, the show's pretty busy already. So. <laughs> I've I w- I've always joked that I would have loved to see more of him in season two when he's fifteen, but on the Justice League, because there's some level of like you're like okay, you're you're ten years old, you're gonna be the little kid on the Justice League. Everybody will look after you, but knows that superpowers you can kind of take care of yourself. Like you're fifteen in a room full of adults. That's so much more complicated immediately. <laughs> right now he has like a black costume and <laughs> grows his hair out a little bit and <laughs> angsty Captain Marvel. Thanks to Captain Marvel, yeah. I would love it. I would love I would love to see that and everybody being like, Billy, no. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's the that's the Groot route, right? <laughs> Just like they did it. Oh, that would be that would be fantastic. Like, fingers crossed for season three, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they not. could. They could. I mean, but like, yeah, like they haven't really uh touched him that much since uh since season one. So yeah. I'd I'd be for it. And in that in that same vein of showing like um Do you have any thoughts about like Zatanna and Rocket and some of the other characters we see who transition from the team to the league to the league and how that kind of plays into all of these things we've been talking about? How do you think that that kind of like either serves the theme, these themes of like teen identity and these ideas that we've been talking about of them being complex characters and how they grow and all of that? Or if you think it maybe takes away from it or just how you feel about that? (laughs) For sure. For sure. I mean, I do. I have plenty of opinions. Uh, (laughs) It's. I have a, my whole career is based on opinions right now. Um, but uh, um, like, I think it's a, like it was important for them to show somebody graduating from the team to the Justice League. Like it's like one of the first things they handle in uh, uh, in season two. So it, like it makes it makes sense that they'll pick the two characters who, you know, the the last ones in are the first ones out because we want to focus on the characters who we've been spending more time with. But then. We don't really spend a lot of time focusing on them, right? So it's uh like I could see what they're doing, but then like it would have made more sense if the show was still just focused on the the main six uh, team members. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I completely understand where you're coming from with that. So uh, before we wrap up, anything else that you want to say? Anything? Any burning thoughts about Young Justice that you didn't get to share? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I was going to I was going to ask you what your like I'd like to know like what y- your favorite episode is cuz like like I know what mine is like Okay. Very far. Uh, so, do you have one? Well, I'm going to I'm going to want to know what yours is after this, but my favorite uh is personally is Terrors from season 1. Uh and I can I can come up with a very like smart answer of it being about like themes of identity and characters growing and understanding their own problems and like how it ties into the first episodes and stuff like that but really it's the very emotional reason of like Superboy and Miss Martian kissed for the first time and I freaked out as a kid watching it (laughs) because yay (laughs) yeah yeah Uh, but what about you favorite episode terrors is the one so I'm just trying to that's the I'm, I'm like looking the it prison, up right the right, prison, the prison one episode. the yes, prison one sorry okay yeah that's prison uh, break <laughs> uh all of that the ice villains show up from the beginning of the season they come back we find out they've had a whole plan uh superboy and miss martian go undercover have to go to therapy for a little while crazy stuff happens giant prison break we stop it they kiss at the end of the episode i cheer like a five-year-old yeah because i love them <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's wonderful that's a great yeah that's a great moment Great episode. Uh, yeah, mine is, I mean, like, it's because my, f- I think this is really just like, this is funny. It's kind of like an extension of who our favorite characters are. Yeah. Like whatever yeah. episode best features them. So like mine's like, it's, um, uh, it's the third or fourth episode, um, but it's the one where they go on a mission and decide who the leader is. Yes. Yes. I think that episode is so well written. Um, like, so 
um, I think uh, it's like Bane's on an island and he's dealing with some kind of uh, uh, super potion and there's other people in there as well. And the team, you know, um, Robin thinks that he's the leader, but he's not a very good leader at all. And they like the show just like perfectly builds up to the scene where the moment where you as an audience member or at least me as an audience member, the moment that you realize, oh, wait a second, Aqualad is the leader here is the same moment that the team figures that out. Like yes. I like I was like perfectly in sync with where their heads were at in that episode, uh, just because the episode had done such a good job of dramatically justifying that as the answer. Especially because it's dealing with that audience expectation that we we talk about every now and then about how everyone going into the show assumes Robin is going to be the leader just because that's what happens in comics. That's what happened in the Teen Titans TV show. Everybody just kind of assumes that yeah. the show is like, no, it's going to be Aqualad. Here's why. And gives you a whole episode that has a fantastic narrative and everything, but it's also kind of answering that question of this is why we're picking Aqualad. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Because, yeah, normally you just pick whoever the most well-known character is to the audience, right? Like, the yeah, the fact that they weren't beholden to that. But then also you have that great moment where Aqualad is like, I'll be the leader now until you are ready for it. And you just, you know, you get chills watching a line like that because you're just seeing, you see, you're seeing exactly where the show is going in that you're, it's going to be about handing the torch down to, to, to Robin um, and you just like can't wait for that. Like it's it, it's a it's an amazing thing in storytelling like that where there's so many stories where if it's predictable it doesn't work at all, and there are other stories where because it's predictable is the reason it's working, and you, you know what that arc is from the beginning, and it's uh, it's like the most satisfying one of the most satisfying parts of the show is like how it navigates leadership as a theme as well. We've talked a lot about identity, but like you know all of superhero media is also like very invested in like, what is leadership? Um, and this show handles that wonderfully as well. Yeah. And with, with that whole idea of like passing the torch on to Robin, the show even goes even further to complicate it more in that black canary therapy scene that we've, we've talked about a couple of times. Cause when Robin says he doesn't want to be Batman someday, it kind of implies that he doesn't like, he's not sure if he wants to lead anymore. He was so sure he wanted to lead the team. And then, he finally does lead the team and it's horrible. And he's like, I don't know if I want that either. And you're like, oh, we we set up this plot and now we have thrown in another complication into it. And all of those ways that the writing just builds on itself every single episode like that. Mm -hmm. So this was awesome. And thank you so much for spending time with us in the Watchtower Sage. Uh, where can people find you here on Earth Prime? um they can find me so my youtube channel is um just right so uh youtube.com slash c slash just right um i also have um so if you like the channel you can subscribe if you really like the channel you can pitch in at patreon um so i have a patreon account at just patreon.com slash just right and then i'm on twitter too my username is sage hyden okay uh, we'll, and we'll include links to all of that down in the show notes for anybody who wants to go check that out because Sage's content is fantastic. Seriously, go watch those video essays, learn some more about writing. If you've get, gotten through all of our Canary debriefs and are like, I need, I need to know more, go watch his content. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it, uh, that means a bunch. And this has been, this has been so much fun. I've, uh, I've loved, uh, being able to talk about, uh, I haven't talked about this show with anyone in, uh, in quite a bit. So, <laughs> Well, we love talking about it. So thank you so much for coming on. And thank you to everyone for sharing some time with us today. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on theyjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com, as well as YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. We are slowly taking over every possible social media we can find. And if you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a lot harder to find those. Uh, and even though season three has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. 
and use hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comicsology to see if we can get uh, some more stories about the team even sooner. Maybe fill in that five year gap. Maybe maybe have some more teen drama going on <laughs> and to get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.